Hi, I'm Sarah Morehouse. When you have to eat gluten-free, eating away from home becomes a lot more inconvenient, a lot more work, and a lot more risky. In this video, I will share what I've learned from experience about how to eat at restaurants and on the road without gl getting myself glutened. I was never much of a fan of chain restaurants before I became gluten-free. If I was going to eat out, I wanted to try a local place, a little hole-in-the-wall ethnic restaurant, or someplace really fancy. But the thing about being gluten-free is that you need reliability. In your town, you can probably get to know some local restaurants well enough to know if they're able to make a truly gluten-free food. But when you're on the road, you don't have that luxury. The good news is that a number of chain restaurants have actually gone through a gluten-free certification process. They have gluten-free dishes, their kitchen staff are trained not to cross-contaminate you, and the wait staff won't look at you like you've grown two heads for asking to have your hamburger without a bun or your prime rib without au jus. That doesn't mean that you can just go in there and blithely order anything off the gluten-free menu. You need to make sure that the wait staff are actually paying attention and understand what you asked for, so they can communicate it with the kitchen. You might still have to ask questions like, and the gluten-free pasta is cooked in its own water, right? The french fries don't share fry oil with anything that's breaded, right? You didn't just pick the croutons off the regular salad, right? My plain chicken breast isn't being cooked on a grill next to a teriyaki chicken breast, right? I know it sounds ridiculous, but you need to check. People really don't understand how big a problem cross-contamination is, and they don't understand how sick we get. So we need to watch out and stand up for ourselves. Yes, it makes you sound like a demanding special snowflake, but you can make up for it by tipping really well. There are lists of gluten-free restaurants online. I'll link to a number of them on the Gluten-Free Knowledge website. You can look up gluten-free restaurants based on the city, and they typically have user-submitted ratings and reviews. They also have an app for smartphones. But if you want a book you can carry around, a good one is Adam Bryan's Gluten-Free Guide to Chain Restaurants. Or, there's also the Gluten-Free Restaurant Guide by Triumph Dining. Just bear in mind that the internet updates, or at least it's supposed to, but a book can get out of date pretty quickly. Also, while the Olive Garden chain is pretty good for gluten-free, a particular Olive Garden restaurant might have an incompetent or a lazy cook. The comments on a website might show that, but a book has limited space. Spur-of-the-moment trips are going to be a little more difficult for you. When you're traveling to a new town, be sure to take advantage of the internet to look up the locations of any favorite, reliably gluten-free chain restaurants. Also have a look at your gluten-free restaurant guidebooks and websites to see what local restaurants are known to be friendly to gluten-free needs. Keep it all organized. You can put the addresses into Google Maps or your GPS, or even write them all down on paper and mark them on a paper map. You've got to do what works for you. But what matters is that you have the information ready before you're hungry and running out of time. You'll need to communicate with the people you're traveling with and the people you're staying with. They'll need to understand that if they insist on going to Fondue Palace or Baked Goods Bonanza, you won't be able to join them. They should understand that you'll need to take the extra time to order, so they should either let you go first or last, depending on your preference, and not question you or distract you while you're talking to the waitstaff. Hopefully your family, friends, and colleagues are not jerks, so they'll actually help you and stick up for you. While you're traveling long distances and staying in hotels, eating, eating gluten-free becomes even more challenging. For some reason, breakfast is an especially hard meal to get gluten-free. I'm guessing it's our society's fascination with toast. And rest stops almost never have anything gluten-free to eat. You may not be able to get away from your day's activities long enough to get to a restaurant that can do gluten-free. This calls for some creative problem solving, but at least you'll know that your meal tastes better than everybody else's microwave breakfast burrito or $9 sub that's mostly iceberg lettuce and mayonnaise. First of all, make sure you that you will never get so hungry that you make the colossally stupid decision to eat something that isn't gluten-free. You'll be regretting it for days, if not weeks. Bring shelf-stable snacks with you, bananas, apples, easily peeled oranges, rice cakes with little single-serve tubs of peanut butter and jelly, and a plastic knife to spread them with, gluten-free crackers and cookies, gluten-free power bars, jerky, nuts, dried fruits, and fruit leather, all good ideas. For day trips, you'll need an insulated lunchbox and a freezer pack. Stick a few healthy snacks in there, and by healthy, I mean snacks that won't poison you with gluten. I don't care if you're eating maple walnut fudge and cheesy corn balls, as long as they're gluten-free and they make you happy. But I like apples and peanut butter. 
And then if you're lazy, just head over to Chipotle because they are the absolute best at making a nutritious, filling, and tasty gluten-free lunch. Just tell them that you need it to be gluten-free and they know exactly what to do. They'll even change their gloves to prevent cross-contamination. And their burrito bowls are per perfectly good even if you can't reheat them. If you're not lazy, or if for some reason you don't like Chipotle, or if you're in some remote corner of the world that doesn't have a Chipotle, you can pack your own lunch. I like to brine chicken legs, bake them in the oven, and serve them chilled. A bag of snap peas and some hummus, maybe a box of, box of rice crackers, and you're set. You can also buy soup thermoses and pack a stew, chili, or a nice sloppy cur curry or stir fry. Make everybody jealous. With everything we go through, we're entitled to these little pleasures. In most areas, staying at a hotel makes things a little more complicated, unless you're willing to go to the Outback Steakhouse and have a steak and a baked sweet potato for every meal during your trip. The solution is what I like to call camping in. First, get a hotel room that has a microwave and a mini fridge. Some hotels even offer rooms with kitchenettes, but they cost more, are harder to reserve, and aren't really necessary. Second, buy yourself a really good cooler. Coleman makes three-day and five-day coolers. The number is how many days it will keep your ice fo frozen and your food cold. When you get into town, hit up the grocery store for ice and food. You're probably going to want to bring your shelf-stable stuff from home just to save a little money. You can have a kit set up. I have a little bottle of olive oil, spices in old Tic Tac containers, and single-serving packets of every condiment you can think of. Wholesale clubs like BJ's and Costco are good for buying those in bulk. Like I said before, you'll also want to pack copious quantities of shelf-stable, gluten-free snack foods. A set of lightweight dinnerware from a camping supply store will make your life better. If you've ever tried eating steak or chili off a leaky, floppy paper plate, you know what I mean. To round out your hotel's cooking capabilities, buy yourself a $15 hot plate and a set of cookware from a camping supply store. That way it's lightweight and easily packable. Or if you want to, you can just bring a saucepan, frying pan, ladle, and spatula from your own kitchen. You're also going to want a knife and cutting boards. Those colorful little knives with sheaths are safer to bring and easy to find in any kitchen supply store. The foldable cutting boards are easier to pack and lighter weight than regular ones. Additional mandatory equipment are a strainer, a vegetable peeler, a can opener, and a rubber spatula that's got a concave side so you can use it as a serving spoon if you want. And of course, bring a little bottle of dish soap and a sponge. If you want to get really fancy, bring a slow cooker. My friend with celiac disease discovered this because she goes to a lot of science fiction conventions that last the whole weekend, and she didn't want to take a lot of time out of her presenting schedule to cook. So she makes something in her slow cooker every day, and it's ready for her whenever she has a moment to get back to her room. They even make slow cookers with two compartments so you can have two different dishes cooking at the same time. Needless to say, if you're going to be doing your own cooking when you travel, camping has a lot of potential. For one thing, it's much cheaper than staying in a hotel. For another, when you're camping, everybody is eating home-cooked food because that's just what you do. That way you feel less like an outcast because everyone else is going to restaurants. Another possibility for saving money and eating in while on vacation is renting a vacation house instead of a hotel room. It's very economical if you have a family with multiple children or a group of several adults. There are even websites where you can arrange with people from other cities to trade houses or apartments for a week, although I've never tried that. Traveling for work is a real bear. There are certain social and professional expectations of us, and dealing with needing to eat gluten-free can sometimes disturb the fragile veneer that we're perfect little working machines of impeccable professionalism who probably wake up without morning breath or bedhead and come up with some innovative solutions before breakfast. Our culture of work wants us to leave our personal life at the door, but this part of our personal life has to come with us everywhere, and it isn't always very good at staying in the background. So, conferences. Some hotels are known for having gluten-free options at their restaurants. Some college cafeterias are capable of providing gluten-free meals to their students, but I have never once found that a conference, either held at a hotel or held at a college campus, can offer me a real gluten-free meal. In some cases, it's obvious that they can't guarantee it's not cross-contaminated. In other cases, they just straight up say they can't do it. The people they hire to do catering for events are often not actually employees, and they just don't get the same training. And the food that they make for events is optimized to be economical for large groups, not for the more varied options that a restaurant or a cafeteria would have. On the off chance they do provide something that's actually safe, it's usually so inedible or meager that it doesn't really count. 
pack a bag lunch, and lots of snacks. Fortunately, I don't have to do business lunches where I have to impress my potential clients or screen potential co collaborators and colleagues, but most of us who work sometimes have to eat with our coworkers. If you can do so, pick the venue. Figure out what restaurants are in the right area and have the right price point and ambience. Then see which of them have at least one thing on the menu that you can eat and prepare it without cross-contaminating you. Then select or suggest those places. If you're not the one doing the inviting or if you're not local, it's harder. You're going to have to be upfront about your needs and do a little bit of educating. Keep it simple and keep your requests minimal. Basically, you need something you can eat safely, not necessarily something delicious. If it's a dry, unseasoned chicken breast on a bed of plain lettuce, you may have to deal with it and pretend you're fine with it. But don't think that requesting your health needs be met is unprofessional or a sign of weakness. It's just another aspect of getting the job done. If you were a wheelchair user, you couldn't go to a business lunch held on the second floor of a building without an elevator, and holding that against you would be severely unethical. This is the same kind of thing. In the past, bringing up this kind of thing had more of a stigma associated with it. Unfortunately, it's still a fact that some people will remember your weird food thing before they remember more important things about you, like the resources, connections, and skills that you brought to the table. The best thing you can do is be matter-of-fact, but not let your food issues become a topic of conversation. Keep steering it towards the business matter at hand, or more pleasant small talk. Stay positive and confident, even if you have to fake it. Some people's weddings have provided me with delicious gluten-free food, other times not so much. The thing about weddings is that the people planning them are also the people who are most excited and nervous and, over and overwhelmed about them, so they often miss little details like the fact that one of their guests has a food sensitivity. If you're close to the couple getting married, talk to them early about the catering arrangements. If you're not close to them, wait until you've gotten your invitation and call them when you are SVP. Sometimes the couple chooses a caterer based on their ability to accommodate di dietary restrictions, and that's good news for you. As long as the caterer knows what you need, you'll have something to eat. Sometimes you're supposed to tell the couple, and they tell the caterer. Other times the couple just give you the caterer's phone number, and it's up to you to contact them directly. Ask them the same kinds of questions you would ask at a restaurant, and if you don't get the answers you need, or if they sound unsure, don't trust that they can give you gluten-free food. If the couple has chosen to have the meal served buffet style, you're probably out of luck. Buffets are impossible to keep free of cross-contamination. But it may be possible to make special arrangements to have a gluten-free plate made up in the kitchen and delivered to your table. Just like with business lunches, a wedding isn't the occasion to talk about your frustrations with gluten-free dining. Unless you're at a table full of people with similar issues who want to talk about that thing, you should come up with something else to talk about that won't bore, gross out, or depress the people around you. If you know that a wedding can't accommodate you, just eat before you go. Even if you're expecting that they can serve you a gluten-free meal, it's better to be safe than sorry. Eat a light meal before you go, and make sure to have some gluten-free snacks on hand because the caterers may not have gotten the message, or they may have made a mistake. If all else fails, you can eat a Lara bar in the lobby and sip some wine. To wrap up, whether you're taking a day trip or staying a week or more, eating out for business or pleasure or a social obligation like a wedding, never let somebody try to nag, convince, persuade, or guilt you into eating something that you suspect isn't safe. They're not the one who has to live with the consequences. You are. And if you give in to them, they'll only do it again, not only to you, but to everyone else in their life. And one last piece of advice from experience. It's hard to eat gluten-free, particularly outside your home and surrounded by family, friends, and colleagues. It's tiring to have to be constantly on guard. It's depressing to have to deprive yourself of things that you want that everyone else is enjoying. It feels isolating, and sometimes it actually is literally isolating when people decide to go on without you because it's just more convenient not to have to deal with your needs. It's hard not to let it, let it get you down. Many people are used to comforting or rewarding ourselves with food, and many of the foods that we would like to do that with are no longer on the menu for us. It's important to make sure that you have a way to treat yourself and unwind. It gives you something to look forward to so that you can make it through a difficult situation and not give in to a self-destructive temptation. It should be something that's simple and affordable so that it's within reach whenever you need it, but it should also be special. Just make sure that you have something that will make you feel like you got your just rewards for soldiering through a 16-hour day where breakfast, lunch, and dinner consisted of nothing but rice checks, jerky, and dried fruit. 
or a wedding where the only things you could eat were carrots and celery sticks. Your treat might be a mug of cappuccino on the deck instead of your usual coffee in a hurry, or a luxurious bath instead of a quick shower. If you've taken up gluten-free baking, you might want to make a really decadent recipe for yourself, but you need to have something. Thank you for joining me for gluten-free travel and dining. Most people find that eating away from home is the hardest part of being gluten-free, not only practically, but socially and emotionally. I hope these tips are helpful.